Good morning. This is 10 o'clock on Thursday morning, March 10th, 2022, and you have tuned into Talking Tax. This show is a an attempt to follow what's going on uh, in tax and public finance. I'm Tom Yamachika, uh, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Jay Fidel, who normally hosts the show, is off today. And with me today, I have uh, a very special uh, guest. Uh, he has uh, made a career out of covering the Capitol and now does it for Civil Beat, the uh, senior reporter there, Kevin Dayton. Kevin. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. So uh, today we're going to talk about halftime at the legislature. Today, as you probably know, is the crossover day. Uh, so bills have to move from one house to the other one. And if they don't by today, they're dead. So uh, we are going to talk a little bit about some of the tax bills uh, that have been introduced and uh, are either still alive or, you know, or thankfully have dropped to the cutting room floor. And um, we've got a, a whole bunch of them. Uh, you would, you wouldn't think that, you know, in, in a, in a special year like this, when everybody's up for election, that they'd be talking about tax increases so easily, but they are. What do you think about that, Kevin? Well, they certainly are. It, it, it's kind of interesting. I was, I was looking back at a little bit of history and, you know, in the past, um, if you think back to 2020, there were a whole bunch of tax bills that were on the table. Now, the, the state budget was in a crisis um, and you know, it looked like the budget was basically melting down in the early stages of the pandemic. And so if you look back to March of 2020, which was also an election year, they were kicking around. Let's see, I got a short list here. They were kicking around. Um, applying the corporate income tax to real estate investment trusts. There was a discussion of even a discussion of, of increasing the state excise tax, which is a pretty dire thing to do. Um, most of that stuff, I think virtually all of it did not pass because of the, the fiscal crisis that was going on and the effect that was having on the business community. But they have been known to consider um, tax increases in election years. So. Um, but I agree with you that it does tend to make them more cautious. And for our money, basically, we're tracking uh, two, so what we consider to be sort of major tax bills. I know that you folks are much more intensive in the way you, you track tax bills, but two big ones kind of stand out to us uh, this year as, as things to watch, although the prospects for both of those bills are a little shaky right now. Okay, so which ones are those? Okay, uh, the one of them would be one that the House just voted on earlier this week, which was, um, let's see, that was the capital gains tax, that'd be House Bill 1507. And I notice you have that on your list of, of bills that you folks are tracking as well. And that was approved in a 46 to five vote. Um, Department of Taxation tells us that if they were to apply that capital gains increase to um, they basically apply it as written that it would increase the state tax date take by something on the order of maybe $100 million a year. So we consider that to be a pretty substantial tax increase. Um, uh, and then the other one would be uh, last yeah, week. But that, before we get away from that, sure, one, let's just sure. kind of go into that one for a little more detail. Sure. Uh, that one uh, is basically two things tied together. One, a half of it would uh, take the state earned income tax credit, which uh, unlike other states is non-refundable, it would make the credit refundable and permanent. Uh, now it's refund now it's non-refundable and temporary. Uh, and it's gonna pay for that by basically making capital gains taxable like any other uh, income that a, a, a normal individual earns. I mean, right now, uh, although the top tax rate is 11 percent uh capital gains go up to uh and and do not exceed seven and a quarter so it's been a little bit less uh, historically the, the reason for that uh, has been because uh, capital gains are kind of made over you know more than one and probably several years and and there is or at least at uh, at the federal level it was perceived that you know, taxing you know multiple years uh, gains uh, in the one year that's realized would you know create a hardship. So rather than trying to average out over the the years that over which it's been um, uh, earned, uh, they basically applied a lower rate to it. Now most states don't do that. 
Uh, most states, from what I understand, uh, do tax capital gains at the ordinary income rates. Um, uh, but then, they, you know, they're applying rates like, you know, five, six percent, uh, and, and they don't get into the stratosphere like we do. Uh, we, we're, we're at 11 percent. I think we're the second or third highest in the country. Uh, California uh, is uh, currently the, uh, uh, the leader of the pack. Uh, this is a race we don't want to win, but <laughs> <laughs> well, we should we should maybe spend a minute uh, uh, talking about the political pitch in favor of this as well. Yeah, um, yeah. That basically the the argument that is that either implied or explicit that's being made is well, this is a uh, capital gains tax, and most people don't realize capital gains. If you're talking about an ordinary working stiff, that's a person who probably is not going to realize a capital gain and therefore it's seen as a, a sort of an equalizing. I think some of the testimony on that particular bill was this is a quote unquote tax loophole um, for the wealthy and we ought to do something to, to, to close that up as a way of making the tax system more equitable. So just just so that that's, you may or may not agree with that, but that is the argument that's being made. Yeah. 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 Certainly the supporters of the bill are arguing that, oh yeah, the tax uh, investments are something that are just made by the wealthy, uh, and ordinary, you know, ordinary working stiffs, uh, you know, bring in wages they're taxed on, you know, this amount of income. Uh, why do we give a tax break to the wealthy? And I think the I think the short answer is, uh, you know, most working stiffs don't reach the, you know, the uh, nine, ten, eleven percent rates at all. So the uh, the, the capital gains are going to be taxed at uh, at or close to what normal people are making. Uh, you know, if you if you've got normal people there, um, and if you've got people who are, you know, in the nine, ten, and eleven percent rate, and yet yet it, it, then it makes a difference. But uh, but for those people, you know, you have to understand that. You know, they're the ones that are paying 80 percent of the tax anyway. Well, to clarify that, what you're saying is since, since most people are paying something below 11 percent on their income, right, because they're not earning, they're not up to the level of earnings where that 11 percent bracket would kick in, then then the, the existing capital gains tax is, you know, maybe closer to what they're actually paying on their income. Yeah, is that? That's, that's right. That's, that's absolutely right. Okay. I hear what you're saying. Maybe we should talk for a minute about the pairing, the decision to pair the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, with the capital gains tax increase, because I think that's an interesting decision that the legislature made to do that. Um, well, it's not I, the only one. I mean, the, the EITC, uh, to make it uh, refundable and permanent, that's something that the uh, progressive wing was pushing over sure. several years now. And... Uh, uh, they were trying different things to pay for it. There was another bill uh, that that so far is in, in the in the scrap heap uh, that would have done it by uh, raising the top income tax rates to thirteen percent. You know, like like as as was proposed last year. But that one, you know, uh, actually it did it did pass, but it got vetoed, mm. and, and the veto stuck. Yeah, I, I, I thought that it was just interesting. The pairing decision was kind of interesting because apparently the House leadership is not real crazy about it. This idea of putting the earned income tax credit, which is something that it's pretty clear that both the House and Senate are pretty enthusiastic about that this year. That's something they want to do, um, either as, a, as a, a concession to the progressive wing of the party or just as a, a good tax policy. They want to, it's pretty clear that the leadership in both the House and Senate want to make the earned income tax credit permanent permanent and want to make it refundable. That's something they feel like they can do for working people in the, in the community. And then to pair that with the capital gains tax increase or to capital gains tax proposal um, makes it harder to pass. And when I was speaking with uh, House Finance Committee Chair Sylvia Luke, uh, I'm going to say about a week ago, she was not very enthusiastic about the idea of pairing those two together. I think she wants to be sure that the EITC passes and doesn't get gummed up in an argument over whether or not to increase that that uh, capital gains tax. So that bill might not be the one that that covers the EITC issue. So when we, we wrote up a couple these, these two tax bills in the civil beat on Monday, and in our discussion of it, we were guessing that that's probably not going to pass. 
well either that or it's still relatively early in the process sure. if they want to you know advance the eitc part uh, and they, they can do that and cut out the capital gains increase if they want just another section of the bill that they can they can ax well there's a million ways to do anything down here right <laughs> I mean, yes, there are, yeah <laughs> So, so certainly that is one possibility that they, they could pursue that. But you you didn't mention that also the House has also approved a bill, since we're talking about EITC, we might as well talk about it now, um, that would that links up the earned income tax credit with the minimum wage increase. Um, those are two what would be called sort of progressive issues that um, are, are, you know, those are sort of crowd pleasers for a lot of people. And to bundle them together like that might make more sense. And I suspect um, because that's the House's uh, way of addressing, that's the bill that on, the, on behalf of the House addresses what's going to happen with minimum wage. I suspect that's going to be the vehicle. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I wasn't, didn't think we were going to talk about this, so I didn't write down the number. I don't have it in front of me. Maybe you do. Yeah, it's House Bill 2510. Okay, right. And that just passed right. uh, yesterday, I guess. Yeah, that was moved with. Right. With I, I know there's, there's some uh, big controversy about that because uh, the progressive wing of the party thinks that bill doesn't go far enough. They want the Senate version, uh, and you know, of the, of the minimum wage bill, uh, and uh, they're they were adv ad, uh, advocating uh, to the House that they vote no on on twenty five ten, but I guess that's a conversation that's going to come later. Right, but if the progressive wing were to prevail and were to convince enough people that they should not support that bill, they would be theoretically surrendering their the, the EITC as well, which is the clever, that's the clever part of packaging those two things together, the earned income tax credit combined with the uh, the minimum wage increase suggests that, you know, if you want one, you got to take the other kind of thing. Yeah, and I wonder whether that's the way it's going to play out. Right. So what's that other big bill you were following? Carbon tax. Um, I didn't see it on your list, but I'll bet it's on there somewhere. I probably just overlooked it. But um, that one, um, the carbon tax is, let's see what we got here. Um, it's a triple referral in the Senate. So it passed the House about a week ago, um, and it is a triple refer referral in the Senate. And again, Representative Luke was remarking to me that, oh, we passed that bill uh, for discussion purposes, which is usually not a good sign when they when they start making statements like that, that this is for discussion purposes. It suggests that that also is on kind of shaky ground. Um, but yeah, it, now, it, yeah. there are a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of movement on the, you know, the fuel tax uh, space uh, occasion not only by you know uh, various carbon tax proposals, but also the Department of Transportation had something uh, called the road usage charge that it was starting to roll out. Uh, they actually had a bill uh, that would change the fifty dollars registration fee for uh, electric vehicles to a road usage charge. But but I think that one um, that one uh, died a grisly death. Uh, although, uh, you know, it's it's never over until it's over. Understood. I, th I think that one will actually be a tough sell because when you when I talk to people, there there's this sense that if they want to change the system, it's somehow going to cost me more. It, there's a there's a sort of a general mistrust of switching from you know, a taxing system that you understand and know and is very predictable to one that's based on the miles that you drive. Yeah, so um, it's it's a concern, and, and I think that's going to be a tough sell. The carbon tax, uh, even more so, I would think. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's really a terrible time to be thinking about, uh, you know, things that would hit people at the pump, you know, given the current geopolitical situation that's already going to make, you know, prices uh, sky high, at least in the near term. Yeah. Now, let's, uh, we're at the halfway point of our show, so we're going to be taking a short break. Uh, we're, we're going to be going into some other interesting topics at the legislature uh, when we get back. On April 1st, at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, Think Tech will be presenting a 90-minute webinar panel program called Burning Global Issues. This will be an examination of six continents by thought and community leaders living in or expert in those continents, discussing burning issues affecting each of them how they relate to the prospects for functioning democracy, and what we can learn from all of that. The moderator for the program is Pamela Spratlin, 
a 30-year foreign service veteran who has served as U.S. ambassador and consular official in a number of overseas posts. The panel is comprised of Carl Baker, Senior Advisor of Pacific Forum on China and Asia, Rupmati Khandakar, Director of Global Relations Forum on India, Elsa Jark Hadian, a consultant with Project Expedite Justice on the Middle East, Gilbert Nuagira, an economist in Kampala, Uganda, on East Africa, Carl Ackerman, of the Social Studies Faculty at Punahou School, on Eastern Europe, and Juan Tello, a business attorney in Bogota, Colombia, on Latin America. The program is sponsored by Project Expedite Justice. We hope you will attend, and that this program will help you better understand these important global issues. Please go to our website, thinktechhawaii.com, and register. Mahalo. We're back in talking tax uh, regarding uh, the half, halfway point at our legislative session. I'm Tom Yamachika. I'm here with Kevin Dayton of Civil Beat, and we're talking about the, uh, the bills that are still kicking around uh, at this session of the legislature. So uh, it's a very interesting thing, isn't it, Kevin, when uh, people talk about, you know, when is a good time to increase taxes? I, I, say, I say almost never. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, you've been hearing, I, I, you, you, just, you just told me during the break, was that uh, some of our key legislators were saying, well, we have a whole lot of money this year, so why do we need to raise taxes? It's, it's, and, and that's true. I mean, we have more than a billion dollars in surplus. Uh, Governor Ige uh, proposed to sock the whole billion dollars away in the rainy day fund. Um, that remains to, to be seen whether that's going to go anywhere. Doesn't uh, look like it. Yeah. And and the governor also had made a pitch for a hundred dollar credit for everybody, and it looks like that's not going to go anywhere either because both of those bills died. Correct. So, so what? Yeah. Do you, so uh, let, the conversation that I had that, that I thought was very interesting was you know, the Senate Ways and Means Chairman uh, Donovan De La Cruz made the point that, that you know it's particularly hard this year to be raising taxes when you're sitting on this normal a normal. I'm sorry, enormous, I meant to say, um, surplus. So you have the governor's proposal to put that $1 billion into the rainy day fund. And after he made that proposal, we had the uh, Council on Revenues come in with a new projection that suggested that the state's going to collect something on the order of about $890 million more than Ige expected when he made his proposal. So I don't have a good feel for exactly how large the surplus is, but it's a monster. And so when you have that much money sitting around, as, as the senator pointed out, it, it is very difficult to make a case for a tax increase. But then as you think about that, the opposite argument was being made two years ago. As the bottom's falling out of the economy, we, we now see that um, nobody, nobody can stand a tax increase at a time like that. Your small businesses are suffering. Your taxpayers are suffering. That's the wrong time to increase. So you don't increase taxes when the economy is down and you don't increase taxes when the economy is up. And both of them seem like very common sense notions. And yet, if you don't keep up with things like inflation and you don't maintain your infrastructure, your roads, your schools and so on, you very quickly have very big problems. And so you have to find ways to raise enough revenue to, to run government. So it's an interesting paradox. It just, it's just it's sort of the political end of things. But both of those arguments make a lot of sense. Yeah. And there, there are of course, a number of uh, people who are trying to uh, use tax as a social policy tool, uh, they, they're saying, well, you, you know, we were talking just before the break about a, uh, a carbon tax. That is, that's a way to uh, be more, you know, force the public to be more environment friendly by discouraging uh, the use of uh, fossil fuels. It, you know, it's like, the, you know, the taxes that are now on alcohol or tobacco, you know, you don't want people to use them, but if, it, but if they're going to use them anyway, let's make some money off of it. Right. And that's kind of, that's kind of the mindset behind those taxes. So why not, why not fuel tax as well? 
Absolutely. But as you pointed out, this is a disastrous time to be bringing something like that up. I mean, when, when you have the war in Ukraine playing out with the full expectation that that's going to have a dramatic impact, it already has on gas prices. So the consumers are going to pay heavily for that. There's another problem with that bill that was pointed out to me. This is I'm talking about the carbon tax bill now. It was pointed out to me by one of the advocates of that bill who, who said that the, there was some some errors that were made apparently in the original drafting of the measure. Um, it was intended by at least some of the people who were supporting the bill that it would be revenue neutral. But in, in other words, what happened, what was, what was supposed to happen is there would be a tax imposed at the pump, for example, it would actually be collected at the barrel level at the importation level, but the tax would be imposed. And then the money for that extra tax would be refunded to the consumers, most of it, less administrative costs would be refunded to the consumers through a tax credit. But the way the bill yeah, was that's actually, exactly what the uh, uh, the council, not, not the council, but the tax review commission, right. which which had just rendered its report, uh, had been recommending that that the uh, yeah let, let's impose a carbon tax for the social policy aspects, but rebate eighty percent of it to consumers. And I said that's that's never going to happen. <laughs> you well, would you say that's never that going to happen? Right? It's never going to happen because they're going to grab the money, or it's never going to happen because it's because not they're going to grab the money. Grab the money. Okay. Well, yeah. anyway, the argument and, and, was... that, and that's you know uh, the the carbon tax proposals uh, that or the the one that they have now HB two two seven a that's what it's got in it. It has yeah, there's a refundable income tax credit in it, but it but it, I believe it cuts off at a certain income level. Um, or, or if, if not this version, the previous one did, it was supposed to augment the low income tax credits. Yeah, what, what I'm told, for what it's worth, what I'm told is that there was an error in drafting the bill. And what ended up happening was you had um, the, the credit was too small. As, as drafted, the credit was too small. And when the tax department actually analyzes the effect of the bill as written, the state has a wonderful, huge windfall. Uh, basically, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year in additional revenue that the state would collect. But that at least one of the supporters is arguing that that was not the original intent. The original intent was that virtually all of the money would be refunded to the taxpayers. Now, I know you may not find that credible, but that's that, that was what they say the intent was. Well, I'm sure uh, that's what the Tax Review Commission's intent was. Uh, but when you get to the Capitol, things take on a life of their own. <laughs> they certainly do. They certainly do. There is... Um, if you want to move on, there's another issue that I wanted to talk about, which relates to property taxes. It's not on the table at the Capitol this year. You want to go there? Let's do it. OK, so there, there's been an argument made for a number of years. You know, there's a great deal of concern about the cost of housing in Hawaii and the extraordinary um, volume of purchases that are being made by out of state and, and international investors, um, either for second homes or for flat out investment properties. And the, the argument that's been made is that the state the way the state and county taxes together are structured encourages that by basically we keep our property taxes low because we fund our school system, which is a major expense out of, of excise taxes and other state taxes, while the counties and the, and the city keep their property taxes low. Um, lower than, than most other comparable places or other, other sorts of similar desirable places such as ours. Um, that then has the effect, the argument goes, of encouraging outside buyers to come in, buy up property here, whether it's for investment or for second homes, and their carrying costs are um, lower than they otherwise would be, or some people would say otherwise should be. So the idea is and there, I've seen a couple of different mechanisms proposed to do this. Nothing, nothing that's moving this year, but it's an interesting idea. If there was a way to sort of prod the counties and the city to increase their rates and then perhaps lower um, the tax rates that are applied by the state. Uh, whether it's for the, the GE tax, which is extremely regressive, it might also have the effect of making the, the tax system overall more progressive. And it's an interesting idea. Um, I'm, I'm guessing maybe you don't think, well, let me let me hear what you have to say about that. Any thoughts? Well, th yeah, th there were some proposals along the, those lines. Uh, one was a, a, what we call a vacant homes tax that was proposed, uh, I think, by Senator Chang last year. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 the big problem with with something like that is it's a tax on the usage of property, and the state has no jurisdiction to impose any kind of tax on the usage of property, because our constitution says that real property tax are, is is exclusively the county's kuleana, um, and 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 you know, uh, 
I think he and his supporters were, were kind of, you know, chewing and thrashing upon that principle and trying to get around it, uh, you know, by drafting some variants of, the, of that measure. But that's what they were trying to do. So either to, to raise the property tax themselves, pass a constitutional amendment, which, which, by, uh, which failed this year as well, right. um, and, um, uh, or, or, or encouraging the counties to, uh, to pass some kind of vacant homes tax. Now, um, and, but, but I, I don't think there's, there's anything that's really made it out of the box so far. But it's, but it's kind of a very interesting dynamic to see that play out. Yeah, the, the feedback that I was getting from a legislator, there's a legislator, uh, Kyle Yamashita, who's, who's been very interested in this idea. And his take was that there, frankly, is not enough trust in the legislature to pursue this issue, that you, what you would need, you would need um, a community outcry to say, hey, we need to do something about the property tax rates at the, at the city level, uh, I, or city and county level, I should say. Um, I have a hard time imagining how that could possibly happen because I, you know, people don't rise up to demand higher taxes on their property um, for any Thing, but but it is an interesting idea because if we are, I want. Do you agree that that the, the tax structure the way it is now is actually encouraging outside buyers to come into this market? No, you don't think so. I mean, it, it, Hawaii is a high tax state, uh, and you know if you look at property tax in a vacuum, then maybe you can come to that conclusion. But if but if you're you know even partially informed, I think. Uh, you would realize that there's all kinds of detriments to investing in Hawaii because, you know, yeah, they won't tax you there, but they'll tax you here, 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 and here. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I, I see your point. If you're talking about setting up a business, I wonder whether purchasing property, purchasing a home, that's become sort of a surefire thing in terms of, of building equity and and making a profit. And I wonder whether taxing it, property taxes, um, could be used to discourage outside investment. Because as you know, we've got, you know, people are crying for affordable housing. And at some point, the state is going to have to do something with that. Um, and the efforts to build more affordable housing don't seem to have done the trick just yet. Yep. I mean, there, uh, that uh, is, is among a raft of problems that we're considering. <laughs> sure. um, you know, uh, dilapidated infrastructure at our schools and airports, um, you know, we have, we have all maintenance backlogs. We have all kinds of stuff to, to worry about and fund. Um, any, any last thoughts before we wrap up this show, Kevin? Uh, no, I just think there's, there's not going to be any great tax proposal that'll be moving this year. I just don't think the timing is right for the ones that are left on the table. It's shaky timing. It's difficult timing, you know, increasing a fuel tax or, or, um, you know, even capital gains, um, while they might be popular in some sectors, I think it, they're, they're going to be a little concerned about it in an election year. Yeah, and especially in this, this super election year where everybody is up, not yeah. just, not just uh, half the Senate, uh, but, but everybody. So it's, it's a very interesting situation to be in, and we're in the halftime uh, of our legislative session. Half, half of it remains, so we'll be on pins and needles until, uh, I guess, the beginning, of, uh, the beginning of May, which is when, when things wind up. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Kevin Dayton from Civil Beat for taking the time to be here today. Uh, Thanks for having me. Our viewers. And uh, uh, this has been uh, Think, Tax, Think Tech Hawaii's Talking Tax, and we'll see you in two weeks. Aloha.